Danach bitte das Neubauprogramm. Vielen Dank. Three minutes. I'm the only Dutch person here. I drove four hours, so I'm going to speak. <laughs> um, I am both angry and happy at the same time right now. I am happy to see that you care. You are here. You made the trip. Some of you came from Poland. Some of you came from Switzerland. I came from the Netherlands. I am angry because of this. Um, consider the moral dilemma we all know so very well. You have two rail tracks. On one rail track, you have a, a, a train with children. And on the other, you have a, a, an elderly person tied down to the rail track, right? And you can flip the switch. You decide who dies. Now, suppose that we take away one risk factor. We take away the elderly person. So the choice now is very simple, right? You just flick the switch, the train goes over the track where there's no risk or anything else, and everybody is okay. If somebody would flick the switch and let the children die, we all would be angry, right? Now, that's why I am angry. I live five minutes from the German border. 30 minutes from my house is Weisweiler. Weisweiler is one of Germany's biggest lignite power plants. It, it emits 20 million tons of CO2, NOx, uh, CO, uh, microparticulates, arsenic, you name it. People get ill from that stuff. In the end, people die from inhaling that stuff. They, they get respiratory illnesses, etc. This plant over here which almost matches the output of Weisweiler, is being shut down. The Germans chose to flick the wrong switch. They are choosing to let people die. It's that simple. They're choosing to let people die. And those people who were here before us, they don't understand that. And if they had, if they had any moral fiber in their body, they wouldn't be doing the stupid stuff they were doing just you know, two hours ago. So that's why I am angry. They should not have shut this plant down, but Weisweiler. But it's, it, it gets even worse. They are going to shut down the other six nuclear power plants that they have. For the lignite power plants, they can keep on burning lignite until 2030, killing even more people. So that's it. When I gave that speech, I didn't know that they would blow up the cooling towers just a couple of months later. I was also surprised to find Polish, French and Swiss people there protesting the closure of the nuclear power plant. Plus me, a lonely Dutch guy, I was literally the only Dutch guy there. So I decided I wanted to see the last six operational nuclear power plants and tie it all together in a documentary trying to help you figure out what is going on in Germany. So off we went on a 3,000 kilometer road trip, interviewing some pro-nuclear people along the way. Class every year had a school trip to this Braunkohle. We had a school trip to, to this uh, pit and to these large excavators and we were taught at school that it's a good thing. And so it was. It was rooted into our culture in North Rhine-Westphalia as, as was the black coal in, in, in the Ruhr. I come from a green clerics family uh, growing up in the 80s um, in uh, southwest of Germany. And um, um, of course uh, we were against using nuclear and of course, I was um, already uh, very much pro renewables. And um, when the right wing government uh, took power in in ninety 
in 98, 1998. I was uh, enthusiastic about that. I remember I was, by chance, I was in Greece at the time. Super happy and very happy that they immediately proceeded to taking measures on this. Agreements were made that the nuclear, that no nuclear plants would be built and they would be phased out over, uh, I think, about a couple of decades, more, longer than, than they are planned to run now. I think around that time I also learned at school that in fact nuclear energy does not emit any CO2 and when I brought this together with my then still rather weak knowledge of physics that made sense and I started to think maybe okay maybe that's it's a bit more complicated than I initially thought. I was so um, infected by this idea when I first um, saw a windmill it felt like future it felt like um, well this is this is so cool this is awesome. It was a project that gave a lot of hope uh, to bring us a better future. I mean, if I tell you, you can have free, clean electricity. It's, it sounds too good to be, to be true, right? I've been told by my teachers in elementary school, I've been told by family members, I've been told by a very scary television series from Die Volker to various uh, pseudo-scientific documentaries, um, that you just see as a child when you're swapping through the television. I have grown up um, basically told by everyone that nuclear power is extremely dangerous. By the time I was 10, I was so scared about nuclear power that every time um, we were driving to vacation and we were driving by some cooling towers close to the autobahn, I would ask my parents whether that power plant or whether that cooling tower, because I knew from television that uh, a nuclear power plant most often had uh, cooling towers. Um, whether that power plant would be a nuclear power plant or a coal power plant. And since my parents basically knew that if they said that is a, coal, a nuclear power plant, I would not sleep that night. So basically every time it was a coal power, power plant. The, the motivation for energy vendor uh, is, is having a healthy environment, but energy vendor alone cannot reach it because a lot of nature has to be covered with wind and solar systems and this is the opposite of, of keeping nature healthy yeah? or not to speak of, of biomass uh, biomass requires large amounts of monoculture and this is straight against uh, biodiversity the german energy vendor is an exit from nuclear energy Renewables serve as a catalyst to mobilize the population, to give them a sense that they can transition away from fossil fuels and nuclear power. But the facts show a different picture, because Germany is the biggest climate vandal of Europe, building fossil fuel infrastructure while demolishing their once largest source of low carbon electricity. In the coming decades, natural gas will be the largest source of electricity in Germany. Situation in Germany, um, for me, it's something that comes for a very long time uh, in the past. In the in the sense that there there is an anti-nuclear uh, sentiment which comes from as early as the 70s, with these nuclear weapons uh, being installed uh, on both sides of uh, of the Berlin Wall. And uh, people were sort of being afraid of uh, of nuclear uh, war, and this comes also from World War II in a way. So there is there is a strong and very uh, I would say heavy uh, history in Germany on nuclear, with some wrong wrongly uh, in a way uh, assimilation uh, of uh, between civil nuclear and uh, military. So this is this is where uh, Germany comes from. Things haven't improved, to say the least, uh, after uh, in the aftermath of Chernobyl, because uh, Chernobyl was not that far from uh, the eastern part of Germany. So there is a, f a general fear on the, the potential consequences uh, that a uh, nuclear accident could make to uh, the environment and the population. When I now read about what happened then, I think, well, it's, as in many other countries, the anti-nuclear movement was absolutely central to the environmental movement. And that has, it was, of course, intimately linked also to the anti-war movement, often also with very understandable reasons. 
and the cultural landscape was that I think in the in the 70s there was still a broad majority among at least in the right and maybe set political center to use nuclear energy and Helmut Schmidt who was the chancellor in the in the late 70s was already informed about climate change and he knew about air pollution and all that and Helmut Schmidt had the vision to switch the German electricity production almost completely to nuclear energy and he said at that time that by 2010 our cars will run on electricity and that will have to be nuclear because it will have to be CO2 free and that's the only option and if you don't want it then uh, then don't have energy and uh, have a nice life with it right already at that time with the upcoming green movement the the more environmentalist movement of his own party said this is this is crazy people don't want that I mean it, is, it was true broad uh, parts of the population were already up in arms against any new nuclear plants and uh, there was a sharp conflict at the time and I think it may have among other factors led to the demise of the Schmidt government. And the last reactor to be um, constructed in Germany, the ESAR 2 reactor, the construction was started still under Schmidt and then the coal government uh, the, which stayed on for Kohl stayed on as chancellor for 16 years, took power in um, 1982, and then no new um, reactor project was started anymore. So if people now say it was the Fukushima and the reaction of the Merkel government, or it was actually the the, the red green government, uh, who, which uh, initiated the nuclear phase out uh, in a way it was even earlier it was uh, when actually with with Helmut Kohl who was officially quite at least uh, I think modestly pro-nuclear uh, that he didn't have the guts to uh, to to do what was necessary for uh, for in, in in the longer side for 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 climate change and uh, fossil fuel plants were built instead it's clear that what happened in Fukushima in 2011 uh, didn't also help because it, the, the, all this resentment against nuclear came back uh, on, on people's mind. And so the broader context is this one. Uh, and uh, the, as a consequence, I would say that the rationals are being left left out in the in the uh, in this context, and uh, nobody is re has really been able to assess and understand the full picture, saying, "Okay, let's." to take an helicopter view and consider what are the, uh, the pros and cons. Uh, and instead of doing so, uh, Mrs. Merkel said in, uh, 20, in 2011, let's get rid of nuclear without any further discussion. In Fukushima haben wir zur Kenntnis nehmen müssen, dass selbst in einem Hochtechnologieland wie Japan die Risiken der Kernenergie nicht sicher beherrscht werden können. Wer das erkennt, muss die notwendigen Konsequenzen ziehen. Wer das erkennt, muss eine neue Bewertung vornehmen. Und deshalb sage ich es für mich, ich habe eine neue Bewertung vorgenommen. Denn das Restrisiko der Kernenergie kann nur der akzeptieren, der überzeugt ist, dass es nach menschlichem Ermessen nicht eintritt. Wenn es aber eintritt, dann sind die Folgen sowohl in räumlicher als auch in zeitlicher Dimension so verheerend, so weitreichend, dass sie die Risiken aller anderen Energieträger bei weitem übertreffen. Das Restrisiko der Kernenergie habe ich vor Fukushima akzeptiert, weil ich überzeugt war, dass es in einem Hochtechnologieland mit hohen Sicherheitsstandards nach menschlichem Ermessen nicht eintritt. Jetzt ist es eingetreten. The, the nuclear industry in Japan was more or less organized like, like the Soviet nuclear industry with a very, very close, corrupt closeness between the regulator and, and the operator and there was almost no critique, no self-critique on nuclear safety and I mentioned already the specificities of uh, nuclear regulation in Japan, so it was a really complex thing and it was not comparable to Germany, but Mrs. Merkel didn't know. And so she, she thought, now I cannot stand anymore in for this uh, nuclear technology in Germany because the protest will all wash us away from power. And she really feared the, the next elections which were due in Baden-Württemberg, which they lost anyway, uh, though they made the fade, phase out but they lost them anyway to the Greens. It was a, I think it was a mixture of real shock, of 
technology imaginaries of Japan, which were not correctly assessed, I think, and uh, simple, you know, power, power um, calculations on how to win elections. She made a political calculation. Yeah, so she, did a, she tried to appease the mob. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's not, I would say I wouldn't say the mob because you know I have been an anti-nuclear activist as well uh, after Chernobyl. I have been part of this mob in, in a way. You no. Know? They have analyzed what would have happened if Germany would not have uh, closed down all these nuclear reactors, but if they rather would have close down all the uh, coal burning plants and well they have built sort of a what if story and what you see is that all these gigawatts of nu nuclear power uh, all these uh, terawatt hours that they would have made they could have still been here and uh, instead they could have closed down uh, coal and if you go through the numbers, then what they think is that in the coming 15 years, if they would have done that, 16,000 Europeans would not have died. Nobody likes coal, but uh, people, um, even if coal is much deadlier than nuclear, um, statistically, um, people um, prefer what they understand and um, people have a feeling for what fire is but what a nuclear fission is it's uh, it's almost witchcraft if you ask people what's more um, likely to kill you a coal power plant or a nuclear power plant I think most people here in Germany will name the nuclear power plant according to a study done in 2019 16,000 people will die if Germany closes their nuclear power plants. This is because they will keep coal around until 2028. I found that at least 11,000 people died so far. And if they go through with this anti-nuclear madness, a grand total of 28,000 people might end up dead from coal-related emissions. And that's the true tragedy of the German choice. Um, there are first debates going on about uh, how how uh, dangerous it is uh, when something really goes wrong at the nuclear power plant. On the one end, there are people talking about a super GAU, that is an accident that that goes beyond your wildest uh, wildest image, wildest imaginations, uh, where a lot of radioactivity comes into the surroundings and there are also wind conditions such that these radioactive substances go all over the country. What we have seen with, uh, with uh, Fukushima is that a lot of radioactive material came out of the uh, re reactors and they went far. Uh, luckily they went overseas there and some part came down into the sur into the surroundings and how dangerous that is is uh, well it depends on your v v view on the dangers of radiation uh, some people say that even if it goes a little bit above the uh, amount of radiation that is licensed now and the amount is measured in millisievert for an, for a normal person going going outside, you now might not get more than one millisievert in a year. Uh, well, when you take a walk in the uh, uh, zones there in Fukushima, you, and you do that for a year, you might get up to 20 millisieverts. And the debate goes on about whether that is dangerous or not. Well, I, as a radiation expert, I think that a level of 20 millisieverts, it is not something you need to, you need to uh, panic about, because very many people that, uh, that work every day get that amount of radiation doing their job. And then I'm talking about uh, pilots, I'm talking about uh, medical doctors, they do that for very many years in their lives 
And when you look at the statistics uh, of these people, uh, then we don't see any difference at all. Uh, so, uh, yes, you will get elevated uh, amounts of radiation, uh, but I don't think there is something to panic about there. If you look at uh, completely pseudoscientific films like Die Wolke, for example, which uh, shows a nuclear power plant causing all kinds of disasters, and if you look at the reality as we have it today, even the worst accidents that we've had, which basically shouldn't have happened if we had taken all the precautions, even these worst accidents that have happened have not uh, caused as much harm as many people think. Personally, I would like to add that uh, um, I, th I think that it's, uh, um, a, it's, it's a very sad thing that uh, people focused more on their anxiety about radi radioactivity than on real human health. So they're focusing on uh, uh, their fear of radi radioactivity and the uh, and the t -t which is very low, uh, that something might happen, while rather they, rather they have coal where, where there is certainty that people will die and people will get sick every year, lots of people. And um, well, to me, that is one of the things that I always wonder about, why, why do people do that? And why can't they overcome this fear? And until today, I didn't find the answer. Uh, but it keeps well. Uh, it uh, it uh, it keeps haunting me in a way that we aren't able to uh, tell that to people, and that they start to feel that uh, it is it is much more important to focus on things that are certain and things things that are going on now than to focus on things things that might happen. The Greens had one large project that was, of course, the exit from, from nuclear. And Schröder, who we all know is a gas and oil lobbyist, you no know, Russian gas and oil lobbyist, um, already at that time regarded, you know, he was from Niedersachsen, and Niedersachsen was a German gas country, you know. Es gibt eine gegenseitige Abhängigkeit, wie wir alle wissen, etwa zwischen Russland, dessen Staatsbudget ja doch sehr abhängig ist von Öl- und äh, Gaslieferungen und uns, die wir äh, auch angesichts der Klimapolitik, die die Regierung macht, angesichts äh, der Tatsache, dass wir sowohl aus der Kernenergie als auch aus der Kohle aussteigen, brauchen wir eine sichere Erdgasversorgung, weil das eine Übergangstechnologie für sehr, sehr lange Zeit sein wird, im Übrigen umweltpolitisch den wenigsten Schaden zufügt. Gas, when you look at its carbon dioxide output per kilowatt hour, it is better than coal uh, because it e e emits about half the amount of carbon dioxide each kilowatt hour as coal does. And it is better than coal, but it is still fossil. So then looking at coal, which they also have a lot of, that, that is, well, the uh, way of making electricity that uh, puts out the most carbon di dioxide per uh, kilowatt hour. And also there are another lot of other uh, substances that uh, come out into the air, uh, soot and, uh, well, all sorts of fumes that are not uh, good for humans. And if you look at the literature, then it is said that uh, thousands of people uh, develop illnesses like asthma, or they die uh, earlier than they earlier than they otherwise uh, would have because of the burning of coal. So when you look at health, uh, coal is the very first thing you would get rid of. Gas has not so much an impact on health, but it has an impact on the carbon di dioxide output and when you really want to go down to a zero then you then you must deal deal with that you must find a way of getting rid of gas and uh, i don't see them them doing that they i indeed think they are locking in on uh, gas 
and that they will be and that they will be dependent on that for many more years to come. The poisoning of a Russian opposition figure has led to the cancellation of the Nord Stream 2 project. But that doesn't stop Germany from importing natural gas. The gas that should have flowed through the Nord Stream 2 pipeline now must come from three planned LNG terminals instead. On top of the infrastructure enhancements, Germany is also planning to build new gas plants. Once finished, Germany will be able to generate nearly 40% of all its electricity using natural gas. Now, just this uh, month, Germany has taken over the presidency of the European Union. And all I can say is I hope Germany doesn't make any impact on the climate decisions during this period. And uh, because what they're actually doing is that they're intimidating other countries in uh, Eastern Europe, for example, not to build, uh, not to go their own course. So on the one hand, you could say, OK, Germany can do what it likes, but it shouldn't stop others from doing what they think is correct, which I think is probably better than what Germany is doing. Let the other countries follow their own approach to getting carbon dioxide emissions down and don't interfere with what they're doing. And um, in the European Commission already, Germany has a very bad influence. And being a hardcore opponent of Brexit, I still see perhaps one good thing that comes out of it after all this is that the UK will be able to build more nuclear power plants than they would be able to do if they had stayed in the European Union. And I can only wish them all their success in doing so. There is strong political pressure on that. For example, what Poland is doing uh, today, Germany is trying to counteract on that, putting more pressure on them to develop uh, renewables instead of nuclear. The same is true for uh, all the neighbors like uh, Central Europe countries, Hungary, uh, Czech Republic, Slovakia, all, all are under some pressure of Germany to change their energy policy. It's clearly Austria, which is a stronger opponent to nuclear, but I would say Germany used Austria as its spearhead uh, and play a role of, you know, a moderator against Austria. But in fact, they agree with Austria, but uh, they, they tend to, to pretend not to be fully uh, following them because they want to keep, you know, a higher uh, position in the debate. But at the end of the day, they are in agreement with what Austria is doing. The question of morality in, the, in this is it's a good question, because at the end of the day, the outcome of their policy in a given, in a way, is bad. It's a failure. They have decreased their emission by only 1%, and they try and uh, give more lessons to everyone around, basically saying, OK, you should develop your renewables. Yeah, sure, renewables is only one solution to decarbonize. And if you, uh, if you back it up with coal, you're basically going nowhere. And this is exactly what Germany would like Poland to do, to back up their coal plants with renewables. Uh, but this is not very efficient. If you look at the, at the, at the results, uh, it's much more efficient to replace first coal by nuke and complement with renewables if you like. But uh, the, you, have to, you have to have a base load which is fully decarbonized, otherwise you will, you're going nowhere. Um, for me, it's very clear. Uh, and some countries like Austria do have a significant share of hydropower, which is helpful. And it has to do with geography. If you look, for example, at many countries in Central and Eastern Europe, this is exactly what they say. They say, we don't have offshore wind power, we don't have mountains, uh, and we have small territories where we, are, we have a limited uh, capacity to accommodate uh, new uh, onshore windmills. So what solutions are left to us? Uh, if you are serious about climate change, you need to have other options. And this is where nuclear is needed. Before I was in uh, Fessenheim, I was here in Philipsburg. 
two months before that. And at the time, the, there were still the two towers, but they've gone. They're gone now completely, showing how fast the energy vendor works in some places. But the interesting difference was that while, I, while we were here, there were very few Germans. Many came from outside of Germany to protest the closing of nuclear. There was no support from any of the unions, no from local politicians or anybody. They just seemed to have taken the orders from above to the way things are going to happen. And despite the fact that also Fessenheim was a very sad event because they closed the first of the two reactors at the time, uh, it was a completely different atmosphere. You saw that the mayor was there protesting against what's happening in, uh, in uh, Fessenheim and about the way the central government is not taking care of their interests. You saw the unions who were there. You saw the local population there. So there was a completely different sentiment that we are not happy at all with the way our central government is uh, treating us. Because Germany has uh, emitted a lot of uh, CO2 emissions in the, in the past, and therefore we are the first ones who should shut down uh, or reduce uh, carbon dioxide emissions. To, to shut down uh, the, the nuclear low carbon energy now would uh, re uh, trash the potential, the low carbon potential of Germany. To get below 1.5 degree, we have to think in Germany and also in Europe and worldwide with nuclear energy, with every technology with is low, which is low carbon. I think it is not very common in Germany to see uh, climate change as a collective action problem, right? And in the sense that um, um, relatively cheap energy is something that all humans want and that also for the a life that we consider decent they need right and then now that relatively cheap and affordable and accessible energy nowadays in the world still comes mostly from fossil fuels so uh, a hypothetical solution to the climate problem um, that requires people accepting much higher costs for energy will probably not work because people who are confronted with rather with a much lower energy use uh, at least that that means serious cuts to their standards of life will not accept it because they see that others may not want to do the same and then that's what what constitutes a you have a sort of prisoner's dilemma that's what constitutes a collective action problem so at least at some point um, and if economic con conditions are not very good uh, yeah, right. Just have a small recession or so, which can always happen. People will not accept further um, cuts to their um, emissions because the, as long as the cheapest energy is still from uh, fossil fuels, say the cheapest non-weather dependent energy. So we need dispatchable, relatively cheap, emission-free energy for everyone in the world. It's clear that since the decision of Germany of phasing out nuclear, so the German nuclear industry are, have already lost a lot in terms of, of scales, capacities, because the, the, the reason is pretty uh, straightforward. Uh, you have a lot of youngsters coming uh, to the job market and they look at what are the uh, what are the sector they should work in because they have the future. They do have a future and clearly uh, nuclear uh, in their mind do not have uh, and it's true also for all the relatively young engineers that were that used to work in this industry uh, at that time and they say that in the last during the last five years so it means the situation has not improved since then they already lost 60 percent of their uh, workforce and particularly the high high skilled workforce it's rather normal in a way you are not giving any future to an industry and then the industry lose loses its workforce and uh, its skills but it will not be difficult to build it again it would take some time clearly it's not not come for overnight but if there would be a different uh, mindset in Germany towards nuclear, then people, uh, the young, the young uh, engineers and uh, could probably come back with some perspectives.
principle, as a uh, political uh, po political optimist, I say every decision which is made by humans can be revised by humans because it it is not it is not it is not a Bible, you know. It is not a commandment. It it's not nature given. It's not in, in this way. It's not physics, you know. It's not physical law that we have to phase out nuclear. That was your question about what we can do about uh, the, the German nuclear fleet. Can we prolong it? Uh, in theory, yes. No problem, because as, we, as I said before, this is a pretty very reliable uh, nuclear fleet as a whole, so there is no question on that. The question is now clearly the, question, the time we, uh, which is left down to 2022. And the answer on that is not uh, so easy because uh, there is no fresh food which has been ordered. Uh, a lot of components which would have been needed to be uh, maintained or, or removed or replaced have not been uh, purchased, purchased yet either. So if Germany wants to, would like, uh, and I can see that operators may not be uh, so uh, keen uh, in doing so, but uh, um, Germany would find solutions, clearly. Uh, let's, let's be uh, very uh, blunt on that. If there is the will to do that, it will be possible. In the fight against global warming and in the fight for um, human welfare, nuclear power is essential. 